Welcome to the edge of the apiary. This is Jake Beeman with Golden Fox Farms here to talk about winterization. For me, winterization is five simple steps. Weighing hives, IPM boards, wind breaks, mouse guards, and insulation. Now, wind breaks aren't necessary, necessary. Uh, wind breaks are great if you're in a windy location. Usually if I deal with wind breaks, I'm putting up something semi-permanent like these uh, chunks of old barn tin that I used to uh, weather guard this apiary when we first set it up. Our first year here at this apiary just happened to be an exceptionally windy year. We really haven't needed to worry about it since. Uh, most of my other apiaries have natural windbreaks and protections. This one just doesn't quite have that. Uh, you can make windbreaks out of political signs, that chloroplast stuff that you stake in the ground. That will work fine, uh, but generally I make them impermanent if I need them. The other things, the other four things, it's me, so I weigh these hives. When I weigh the hive, I'll note the, the weight on the lid when I do it. It's more so for me to reference it as I come back through and check on these hives later to see what their weights are doing. As you've seen before, I aim for 90 pounds on my doubles and 70 pounds on my singles. Uh, that gives them about 40 pounds of feed, so any place you stray from that, or rather 40 pounds of bees and feed. So any place you stray from that, you're either increasing or decreasing the amount of stores they have to go through winter. Uh, the reality for me with that, or for you with feeding and all that, these are targets. They're, they're not have-tos. Uh, really, the ideal is you get most of the apiary up to weight. Uh, there will always be hives that burn through stores faster than others. There will always be hives that burn through stores slower than others. And in any apiary, any significantly sized apiary that doesn't have really aggressive uh, management, you're going to have some dead outs over winter. And you can salvage that comb and that honey for your light -like colonies in the spring. So there, there's a lot of tools at our disposal. Uh, we will want to monitor that weight as we check on these hives through the winter. So the other three things. One technique popular in my area is the foam board. You take a piece of hard foam board and you put it between the inner and outer covers. Most people will tell you to flip the inner cover to where the top entrance is common to the hives. That's a fine thing to do. Uh, most of my hives are actually set up that way. This one's set up backwards just to see if it actually makes a difference. This was a Kelly style, which was flat on this surface, but I put this rim on it to give them B space. Uh, the entrance on this thing, is there a front entrance? There is. There's a front entrance common to the box. Uh, and that is the recommendation people would have in this area for wintering. Now, I don't know if that was because everyone used Kelly, because this is the region where Kelly's was. And if they didn't flip the inner covers, they'd have this flat surface on top. If the flat surface was on top and the bees couldn't go over the top of the top of the frames, they couldn't move laterally once they got to the top of the box. So I halfway think that's why they told people to flip these things around. This is what their thought process was when they came up with this. If you put that top entrance coming to the box, it improves your ventilation rate and keeps you from having condensation problems. Now, the other thing you do with this is you put a foam board over this. And that will give it a thermal break between the top of the colony and the outside world. So ideally, if there's something under the dew point, it's the walls and not the roof. And that's all it is. It is a chunk of hard foam. Now, I'll tell you, the bees do have a tendency to try to chew through these things. And the way you fix that is you put a little duct tape on it. Bees aren't fans of duct tape. So if you put a lot of duct tape right where that hole is, that was a oval hole which goes with a porter bee escape, which is the old way to get bees out of your supers. Uh, I don't even know if anyone still sells porter bee escapes. Come on, girlies. You all need to go into the... You all need to go in. You need, you need to go in. Oh, come on. Good enough. Good enough. And we just put that board on top. And put her adder on there. And that'll hold her. Now, one of the things you'll have to do is knock off these high points of wax when you put these foam boards on. Because if you don't, those high points of wax end up kind of perching your foam high. Uh, that's just the half inch product. In reality, it's five eighths. 
uh, but it's the smallest one they sell, and that's enough to give you that thermal break. If that foam block wasn't there, this top would be much colder on the inside of the hive, and it would facilitate dew occurring there. So anytime the hive went below the dew point without that foam board, the dew would form right over the bees' heads. By using that foam board, that top is now warmer, functionally warmer, so the dew will occur on the side walls, which is not nearly as troublesome. In some respects, it could be beneficial for the bees. Mouse guards are simple, little devices. This one down here is just made of half-inch hardware cloth. Uh, and you can buy this stuff by the roll at your local hardwood store or tractor or outdoor lifestyle store. Uh, I use the half-inch stuff. You can use a quarter, but I think half-inch is better. Half-inch is enough to keep the mice out. Uh, and you just take it, cut it, and bend it into pieces like this, and then staple it over that entrance to keep the mice out. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, when bees get cold, they go in a cluster below 55. Uh, mice operate at much lower temperatures, so a mouse can come in the front door and wreak havoc in there, and the bees can't break cluster to deal with it. Uh, so this is one of those things that can save you a lot of headaches in the apiary. Uh, I have a friend that lost about 30 hives to that one year where his mouse guards, he didn't staple them in, just shoved them in, they pop back out. They make stamp steel ones. They work fine. Those are just cheaper, and you can make all a bunch of them. The last thing is the IPM board. Most of my colonies are on screen bottoms. It's just something I found preferable. And I'll slide these things in underneath. And what these do is they largely block off that opening and reduce the amount of wind that will blow through. Uh, debris will fall down onto this thing. You can check it for mites or try to determine what's going on in the hive. Uh, the reality is not great for mite control per se, but it can tell you if you have a big problem or not. Okay, so here's the hive we're going to winterize to demonstrate. This does have a top feeder on it still. It is a single deep. It has a screen bottom board. It's kind of an inner cover underneath this thing. Now, caveats, I believe we are past the freeze actually or the frost in this spot. Let me rephrase that. The bees aren't acting like there's anything here to forage. There's not many bees flying around. The only hive that has anybody really hanging out on it is the green nuke down the way. Uh, so, odds are there's not much of a flow right now, so with luck there's a lot of bees in this hive because you're not going to see it at the entrance. It looks pretty dead at the entrance. Uh, one thing I do have to say is this actually has the IPM board in it already. This must have been a small colony I left it in just to help them thermoregulate for the year. And you can see where you can find one of these things. Uh, some mild bits of trash from caps over time. Uh, there are some ants on this one, which is not a surprise in the slightest. Uh, and Varroa mite wise, I'm seeing essentially none, but also people will tell you that the, the ants will actually uh, take those mites out. They'll eat them. So, it doesn't really say if we have a load or not, it just says we don't obviously have mites dropping down. So let's go ahead and get into this. I smoked the front already. I have my smoker handy there in case we need it. This hive was 36 pounds, and I fed them four and a half gallons. So doing that math, four and a half gallons is 45 pounds finished feed. Plus 36, that should put us at right around 80. Odds are some got consumed, so it's going to be less than 80. But my target is, you know, 70, so that's fine. Now I do have bees in here. Uh, if I have a bunch of hives with these feeders on them, I'll just do that, pop it, and then come back in a moment because a lot of times the bees that are in these feeders will descend after you do that. Since this is the only one in this stand and there's only whatever these two stands have worth of hives in this yard, I'm not going to do that. If this was one of my large yards, yeah, I'd just set the feeder on the ground next to them and let the uh, stray bees work their way back in. This one's going to move a little bit faster. Now, I have bees on both sides of the chimney. That makes sense because I played the smoker into the middle. Uh, the other issue with these feeders is they are recessed on the bottom. So they maintain bee space. That means the bottom of this can be covered in bees. You can just play the smoke in that top. And then you actually crack the feeder itself free and just play in smoke on the outside perimeter. That smoke on the outside edge 
will cause the bees that are on it to dive down into the combs. So this can get a lot of the bees off for you. What we got down there? Ah, oh, it's not crazy. It's not crazy. Here's how you deal with these bees. I'm not crushing anyone doing this. I'm just hitting the edge of the two pieces of equipment and that'll just knock the bees off. I still have some bees on this side. I can do the same thing on this side if I'm so inclined. I will take the time to pull these feeder slats out first because these can bounce around and crush bees as they move around. Most of these bees know where home is so don't worry about launching them into the air. And then I'm going to shake the bees out of this feeder into the hive. Or just smack it together. That works too. So now I need to winterize the top end of the box. I'm going to take this. You put the entrance notch down. Like that. Foam cover with the tape against the hole. Outer cover on top of that. Now the other thing I'll do while I'm here, actually two other things, one is I'll put the mouse guard on, and two, I'll weigh the hive. This is my mouse guard for this hive. It's wide enough to cover the entrance I have on there, and I can bend it and shape it to fit that entrance about perfectly. And I'll lock it in with some 3 8 inch staples. If you have some bees that are a little bit sensitive, to noises and knocks, this is not something to do barehanded. Uh, if you have Russian bees, this is not a good idea. And you know, usually I put three staples in because I feel pretty confident three staples is not going to come back out. Let's see how much this hive weighs. Again, it should be somewhere around 80. That side is 32. Oh, you know, it helps if you lift the whole hive. And that side is 35. 67 pounds, yeah, that's really great. Uh, I overfed them by about 10 pounds, but I knew it was going to be a long, long, uh, long fall before our freeze, so I fed them a little on the heavy side, knowing that was coming. I'm going to set this one up the normal way with the entrance common. Kind of randomly distributing where stuff happens. Because that keeps your data a bit more reliable. Alrighty. So they're down and on there. As you can tell, this thing's got plenty of bees in it. that back on. What else we need to do on this one? IPM. This is a zucker. Slide that on in. This one is a little tight. That's okay. Oh, good enough. Way. If you are looking to be more efficient, you could also weigh them all at once at the end. But weighing as you go, sometimes you'll find hives in trouble that you didn't realize you had. That side is very light. That side's 27 pounds. This side. This side is 31. So 31 and 27. Uh, that's 58 pounds. That's not a great number either. Uh, but it's good enough not to worry about it until I come back with solid. There's 20 pounds. Is there 20 pounds? Yeah, this is a single. Uh, a single, this is about 20 pounds, and your tops and bombs are another 10, 15, depending what they're made out of. Uh, so there's still a good 20 pounds of bees and feed in here. They're going to be okay for a while still. Okay, this one still has a feeder on it. And I'm just going to Rochambeau and just slap these out of it. Because a lot of times that's just easier for me. Alrighty. Uh, obviously plenty of bees in here. Nothing to worry about population-wise on this one. 
We're going to reverse it. Thirty-seven. So she's sixty-seven, which is fine and dandy for a single. This has a feeder as well for me to get out. Bunch of bees in the top of this one. I bet they're really light. Anytime you got a bunch of bees at the top of a hive, that usually means they're pretty close to being out of food. And it's just one of those things to be aware of. They are pretty light. Uh, this needs to come off anyway, though. Once we're below 55, they really can't take liquid feeds. Uh, if the liquid feeds stay warm due to solar gain or weather or whatever, they can still take them. Uh, in my experience, usually it's just going to stop. They're not going to find some magic way to continue on taking those liquid feeds. So we're going to have to switch to solids, which is something I try not to do. I don't like relying on solid feeds. It's just it's better than having them starve. So. All right. All right, not nearly as many bees on the top of this one. All right. What's going on in this hive is these the, these two outside frames and this one here aren't drawn. Uh, they maxed out what they could. I should have put more drawn comb in here when I put this hive together, but that happens. We always have an ideal we're chasing, and sometimes we get there, and sometimes we do not. Now here we have uh, another hive stand with decidedly different things going on. These are all nukes. This is a single. I prefer to run doubles them side by side when I can just because it increases their survival just a little bit in my opinion. But all of these have paint can feeders on them. So I'll have to take all those paint can feeders off. I'll have to see if they're empty. Uh, one of the issues with paint can feeders is sometimes they can hold feed longer than you want it to. Sometimes the bees propolize over them. Uh, so now all the feed ends up in the colony. So I'll have to see where these colonies are once we get that stuff off. Uh, we also have a slightly different method to foam these. All right, let's put that there. Second. And that's all there is to this thing. Uh, just some paint cans sitting on some shims. It is a lot easier to get the bees out of these feeders though. Now, one thing, I'm going to drag the camera over to show this. As you can tell, these hives are really shoved the feed in, like without even weighing these things, just looking from the top. And the tell on that is just look how bulked out those frame sides are, how much that wax stands out. Uh, they really loaded that thing up, which is what they're supposed to do. I've got goofball equipment because that's just what I do. These things have these raised rails on the sides of them. Rather than trying to find some way to close that off, the, the foam boards I use on these will reside between those rails, like that, uh, or even wider. Uh, this one's just a little small, but it's good enough for me for this one. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to weigh this. So she's 63 pounds on 1024. Uh, she'll be good. For a while. Uh, this hive here, two five frames weighs roughly the same as a single 10 frame um, in terms of the amount of wood that goes into pieces because, like, this thing has twice the inner cover, but this one has an extra wall, so it balances out. Uh, so it's roughly 24 pounds for the wood and the wax. Uh, your bottom board, whatever the heck it weighs. Now this one doesn't really have an outer on it, uh, so it's actually skewing the data a little bit 
lower than it should be. Uh, but, you know, again, if this weighs 24 pounds, and let's say that weighs 10 pounds, so 34 pounds, there's still 30 pounds of feeding bees in here. And that's going to last until spring. Uh, this colony won't get hungry until spring, if it does. If it does. My bees tend to be pretty thrifty. And I can get away with a lot more than a lot of people can. Uh, still syrup on this one, too. <laughs> well, that's how it goes. They won't all be perfect. Oh, that one's empty, at least. So they got most of the syrup. What I'll do with that last bit of syrup I have left is I'll just open feed it in my home apiary. Because it's really not worth digging around in these hives any further for this year at least all i'm gonna end up doing is squ squishing bees and they've got a decent bit of weight in there so i should skew the foam towards the center because that is where these bees are going to cluster on these doubles. They will actually somewhat share the same cluster space. So I just need to be aware of that when you set up these doubles like this, that they're going to have a communal wall between them. So you want to make sure your insulation is there with it. So let's review the big ones. Wind brakes if you need them, foam board for a thermal brake, mouse guard, IPM board and note your hive weights so you can trend and see who's in trouble come spring. And with that, I'll say good luck out there and happy beaking.